Hello, this is Stuart Nakbar with Educated Quest. With me is Brian Dwyer. He is Assistant Director of Admissions at Chatham University in Western Pennsylvania. I asked Brian to join me today because Chatham really has an urban campus, but also a sustainable campus about a half hour from the great city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I believe it is like the only sustainable college campus community in the country. And since people have always talked about green living, green energy, um, thinking living a sustainable lifestyle, I thought it would be useful for students and parents and counselors to know what that actually means for someone who is a high school senior or a college transfer student who thinks they may want to try the lifestyle in a hands-on way. Brian, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Stuart. I appreciate it. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, can you tell me, um, what is the typical freshman who would live in Eaton Hall? Eden, yeah. I'm sorry, like uh, the Garden of Eden. <laughs> um, and, and for some of our students, it, it certainly is. But, you know, I, I don't think a, a typical student for the Eden Hall campus is really too much unlike the, the student population that we have here at Chatham University. Very engaged, very solution oriented. Um, you know, at the university in general, we have a mission and values towards um, sustainability, civic engagement, um, leadership. I think for the students that are, are seeking out our Eden Hall campus, particularly to live at and, and to study there, um, they, they have a lot of those qualities that a lot of the rest of the student population has. They just uh, tend to want to focus that a little bit more as to how our environment might be affecting our um, economics in, in our communities or how our communities are impacting the environment in business and, and so on and so forth, kind of through that triple bottom line um, closed system of what is sustainability in that campus. So, um, you know, that, that typical student, if anything, they're, they're very engaged. They're looking for um, a project research-based learning curriculum. They really want to, they want a tangible experience. They really want to kind of, whether that's put their hands in the mud, be working on the field, um, talking with our faculty about uh, renewable energy solutions, green jobs, um, working with different companies and organizations on refining maybe how they're addressing sustainable human capital or um, how they are addressing corporate social responsibility. So the, the students that are looking at us, you know, they, they do their homework, they do research, but um, there's a lot of a streamlined transition, if you will, from their engagement at the high school level with whether that's, um, you know, a green club or an environment club, um, student council, student leadership. And when they're involved in high school, they're really looking at, at our university in general, but especially our Eden Hall campus as a way that they can just continue that in a very streamlined, in a very streamlined manner and make some very um, effective um, campus connections. The students who, who, who have come to visit Eden Hall um, to consider, to consider the, the campus and consider the university, what other schools are they, they typically looking at? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll be honest, it, it's, it's very much a mix. Um, you know, some of the ones that really come to mind in, in maybe the private liberal arts sector would be, um, you know, an Allegheny College or a Juniata College. Um, you know, those are, those are pretty popular options. But, you know, if you're talking a little bit more at a larger scale, you know, we cross a lot of applications with uh, the University of Pittsburgh and Penn State. Um, even most recently, um, looking at some of, you know, historical data, um, a Paul Smith's College, a, a Unity College as an example, but Cornell University as well as the University of Pennsylvania are certainly within there, uh, within that as well. And, and again, I think it just goes back to the student application. I think it goes back to um, where those students are kind of seeing where they're really effective and they're really successful and, and they're looking at schools that are going to help give them a platform to do that. So, um, you know, certainly when you're talking maybe about some of those eco league schools, even like a Dickinson, as an example, or a Paul Smith's, you know, those are certainly um, similar schools where kind of their focus is very much um, similar to ours. Um, how many freshmen and then how many total undergrads live at Eden, Eden Hall? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, our, our dormitory, what's known as Orchard Hall, which is um, 
built to lead platinum standards on, on our campus. So a uh, state of the art building and it's, and it's really unique in all the features that it has. Um, also our newest residence hall at, at Chatham University in terms of um, ground up construction. Um, there's a little over 60 beds on campus and uh, prior to the pandemic, we were at um, 45, there were 45 students or, or beds, if you will, um, filled on that campus was act with actually an upward trajectory of, of pretty much filling out the building. The pandemic unfortunately reversed that um, a little bit, but we were still able to keep about 50% of um, the students who were wanting to live on that campus still on there. There's some, um, just given the unique parameters of that campus, there are some things from a social and physical distancing perspective where it, the campus played out in an advantageous way for those students wanting to still live there. Um, but uh, I think, again, going back to the student that wants to be here and they want to live on that campus, it's a living learning environment. It's 388 acres of woodlands. So the students who are lo looking to live up there, um, they're already kind of looking at different faculty connections that they're making, whether that's, you know, with Dr. Utes um, and doing different research assistantships um, and great opportunities that he has in our woodlands and as it relates to um, aquatic ecology or, or Dr. Weitzel um, in our aquaculture lab. Um, Dr. McCagnow has some really great stuff um, from a business perspective and how he's looking at green and social innovation relating to products, um, green products, so to speak. And then, um, you know, even like Dr. Johnson and her focus on botany. My, my point would be that the campus is such a living learning environment in the woodlands and our meadows and grasslands farm systems of the campus really play into the students overall um, academic course load. And, and so for the students who are living up there, it, it's really an attractive fit for them that they can be living in a place that essentially um, reinforces what their core values and beliefs are um, in terms of just a living community and a living environment. Have you noticed since the campus opened that students want to live there for longer than two semesters? Oh, very much so. Um, it's actually, you know, it's quite common that um, even for incoming first year students, uh, it, it's, um, and it's really cool that, you know, after their first year, there, there's a lot of them that, or excuse me, after their first semester, after, you know, even this fall 2020 class, I've, I've been hearing a lot of feedback um, on interest just moving up to the Orchard, moving into Orchard Hall or moving on to the Eden Hall campus um, following this following this initial semester, which is just great. And I think, again, for us, it plays into, it plays into kind of what our overall philosophy has been and on creating a sustainable campus community and working from the perspective of finding the right fit and helping students understand where their fit is on our campus, not really focusing on, you know, a blanket number of how many individuals can we have on our campus, but how many individuals want to be on our campus, how many individuals are finding a fit, whether that's from an ethics perspective, whether that's from an academic perspective, how many of them want to be on here, and, and that really helps drive a lot of our applications, and, and it's really unique because you kind of see the campus and the campus community ex itself recruit the type of students that, that want to live there. So um, we, we certainly see an interest year over year um, as, as we're looking for that. So hopefully once we're, we're through the pandemic um, and we're kind of able to return to uh, life as normal and certainly what it was in, you know, up to 2019 in that, in that time frame, we're really looking forward to uh, just, again, continuing growth of that campus. And, and we're really seeing a lot of positive interest as it relates to living up there um, and not just for a year, but um, there's a lot of students, like I was talking about before, from a research assistant standpoint, who um, they don't only live up there over the course of the school year, but they'll live up there over the course of the entire summer. Um, and then maybe even transition living into the following year. So it, it's definitely a common practice that students aren't necessarily just up there for a year and then, you know, gone. Students who come to Chatham for a bachelor's degree, do they spend time on the campus in Pittsburgh and Eden Hall? They do. They, they, they absolutely do. So um, a lot of our core structure and, and you know, I think um, as from an administration standpoint, from a leadership perspective, um, 
there's just a lot of cohesion and, and co uh, cohesion around our campus as to how can we make an optimal student experience and, and how and what does that mean when you have a campus that has the physical distance that it has um, and really when you think about driving the the 16 16 miles north um, that's not really that far but what makes it a little bit further would be uh, the stoplights in like everywhere in between right um, you know that being you know that being said we structure the the courses that happen predominantly on Tuesdays and Thursdays and then as students you know certainly matriculate through the program their course load will find them up on that campus more um, but there's certainly a healthy balance in mind um, of engagement not only at the Eden Hall campus but also back to the shady side campus um, or our more urban campus if you will I think again it's just another unique feature that our institution has but um, you know, Chatham University, we're located next to about a thousand square acres of green space, aside from being a, an arboretum. So um, we have, you know, what's known as Frick Park and Shenley Park, you know, both within about a mile and a half of our campus. And I think Frick Park is home to the Nine Mile Run Watershed Association, which we have faculty um, and students who partner with monitoring that. And Frick Park in itself is about 642 square acres. And Shenley Park, again, um, a little bit more in our Squirrel Hill neighborhood, borders a little bit against the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. Um, they have four mile run. They also have um, a pond there as well that's home to a lot of different aquatic life and animals in four mile run. So um, there's a lot of opportunities when you're talking about studying sustainability, when you're talking about studying the environmental sciences and food studies that just don't necessarily relate all at the Eden Hall campus, even though that's where I would say a lot and a majority of that opportunity and engagement happens. There's certainly a big focus back on the overarching community here, whether that's our park system or the communities that surround us here in Shadyside. The Shadyside campus, I've, that's the one I've visited. Yes. Um, that has an interesting look and an interesting history to it. Can you tell, tell us, uh, for people who have never uh, are unfamiliar with Chatham, Talk about that campus a little bit too. Yeah, our Shady Side campus. Um, you know, when when it started, we were um, it ha is on the footprint of Andrew Mellon's summer home. Um, so we have some really unique buildings and residential spaces that that make up our campus. Um, you know, where his where his uh, horse stables used to be is is now our student union and and just such a dynamic and cool building on on how that was been able um, to be salvaged and and saved. Um, you know, our art and design center used to be one of our, um, used to be an, our old basketball court and, and sport facilities there. Um, so as our campus has kind of evolved and as our campus has grown, we've also grown with the residential community that, that surrounds us. And so you almost have this, um, you almost have this really unique feel of that if you're standing in the middle of our campus, you would have almost no idea that you were in the city of Pittsburgh. It's a really... Um, unique feeling almost and, and I'm reminded every day I have to make sure I take a walk around campus um, every day because it's a fortunate place to be and, and the community so engaged as well too but um, you know we're right down the street from a lot of prominent institutions from the city of Pittsburgh um, but it gives you a really unique feel um, that you are on a very defined private liberal arts campus that, you know, quite frankly, used to be the summer home of one of the most wealthy industrialists in the United States. Um, do, for undergrads, do most of them live on campus, whether it's at Shady Side or at Eden Hall? They do. They, they do. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh, um, in general, excuse me, Chatham University, and just where it is in the city of Pittsburgh, our residence halls in our in our residence life office they just do such an amazing job of ensuring that these students have spaces to just some awesome communities and neighborhoods that surround the immediate campus community so um it's it's something where when you visit um you almost you know automatically off the bat even if you were thinking about you know commuting um there's no way you can step on our campus and just not think wow this would be this would be a really cool place um, to live and then certainly as you're a um, maybe more of an upperclassman we have some more independent living if you will um, down on our fifth uh, down on fifth avenue 
um, you know, right behind our uh, science center, actually. And what's really nice about where our apartment complexes are is they, um, they filter directly back up into the campus community. We have stairs that connect that all in. So it's not even separated necessarily from the rest of campus. So you will hear students refer to upper and lower campus, if, as you will, um, as it relates to uh, more residential living, but it's certainly a really popular option um, in general for students to live on campus. And certainly the majority of our, of our students do. Now Eden Hall itself is fairly new. Yes. Um, what were what were some of the difficulties in building a campus community? Um, for one, it's this is not exactly a community that looks like any other college campus, and two, it is new. And uh, what what, are, what were some of the difficulties in terms of human like dynamics between people, um, people seeing well is sustainable is sustainable lifestyle really what I want or or yeah. did they already know this is what I wanted and I'm happy. You know, I think it was a little mix of both, and, but I think when, when you talk about challenges, you, you certainly have to talk about just the absolute buy-in of the institution that we were going to be committed to this, um, whether that was with our former president, um, Esther Barazzoni, you know, overseeing this, and with Dr. David Feingold now, um, and his commitment to that campus and, and sustainability um, throughout the institution. I think the leadership in general gave us just a wonderful opportunity to maybe overcome the challenge of, you know, one of the ones that I think of mostly is that distance barrier. Um, and at first, you know, and I'm talking about it as a challenge and, and quite frankly, now five years, six years later here at Chatham, I, I don't really even talk about that distance as a barrier anymore. It, it's just not in the way we've really cohesively meshed those two campuses together from a transportation perspective, from an activities perspective, um, I think, you know, when you're talking about sustainability, maybe um, in studying this campus and what does this mean, um, you know, five or six years ago, especially for undergraduate students who, you know, they're really working closely with their parents and their social networks as to, you know, what does this mean? What is this outcome? Um, you know, crafting a curriculum that's addressing the problems of now that's very solution oriented. So, you know, when, when students are visiting our, our campus in general, whether this is for our sustainability, environmental science, uh, food studies, our fault school majors, if you will, or, or just majors through the School of Art, Science and Business or Health Sciences, you're leaving with a curriculum, you're leaving with tangible evidence as to you know, if you're going to be studying sustainability as an example, well, you can see that you're going to study quantitative ecology, you're going to study geographic information systems, you're going to focus on um, corporate social responsibility, you're going to focus on writing about environmental science. And so that way you can kind of understand when you're thinking about maybe that dream job, um, or what that optimal outcome for you from like a grad school perspective is, you can really help draw that draw that map. And so, you know, when when we were first, you know, constructing the campus in 2015 and 2016, as the Esther Barazzoni Center was, you know, still under construction and, and finalized, um, it was really unique to bring students onto that campus, even when it was still being constructed, to show, you know, our artificial wetlands on how we manage all of our wastewater on site. Students are living um, in the in the pinnacle of what green building and design is in terms of Orchard Hall. And then to see where you would be um, studying just in terms of an overall hub or an overall base with the Esther Barazzoni Center um, under that construction, you know, these students were really just visualizing, wow, when I start here, there's just going to be this amazing opportunity to be involved immediately. And I think that is something just in terms of the overall campus culture that we've really focused on. There's an opportunity for you to be involved immediately. You don't have to, um, you know, necessarily compete with people for research or involvement. You don't have to, you, you really just have to want to be there. Um, and uh, those students then in turn, um, again, another maybe perceived challenge in terms of population, they, they then start to recruit themselves almost, or it becomes this destination that, that a lot of our students want to be at. Um, we've also just done a wonderful job of making the campus, the Eden Hall campus community, a wonderful destination for students not majoring in folk school majors like sustainability and environmental science. And um, maybe if that's a business focus or a policy studies, um, political science, you know, we have a creative writing seminar um, a creative writing seminar that happens over the course of the entire summer. 
Um, our K through 12 programs, um, they just do a wonderful job of engaging the entire uh, K through 12 population of, this, of the greater Pittsburgh area and helping students understand you know, what is green building and design? What does sustainability mean as I keep hearing this word? You know, if I'm looking at environmental science, well, what, what does that, what can I focus on? Where does that go? Um, and so they give us a really amazing opportunity to immerse students in that campus from a curriculum and an academic standpoint. So, you know, the challenge is certainly, you know, they, they come maybe with a little bit of distance. Um, they come maybe with a little bit of just that new major, but Again, that was probably 2015, 2016 challenges. You know, now we're, we're probably looking at a little bit more um, from the perspective of um, our challenges are making sure that, you know, our students are, they're, they're, they're staying engaged and our biggest challenge is making sure we're keeping up on our promises as an opportunity um, for them to achieve their targeted outcomes, which of course is always an exciting thing to be a part of and, and is my job um, in the Office of Admissions it's a wonderful opportunity um, to work with such motivated individuals and motivated young students that when I'm showing them around campus and, and they're speaking with our faculty, um, for a lot of them, they just immediately find a connection. Now, just, I wanna go a moment to the two, two majors um, promoted at Eden Hall, yeah. uh, food studies and sustainability. Yes. And when, when students have applied to Chatham, and checked off these majors on their application. They might have even written an essay indicating their interest in, interest in those majors. If they come with the idea of maybe studying these subjects further, do they tend to stick with it? Yeah, they do. Our, our retention in those programs um, are, are strong. So I will, I, I'll just kind of say real quick, the sustainability program has probably been the longest enduring program. The Bachelor of Science of Sustainability has been the longest enduring program at the undergraduate level. And we have four tracks within that program focused on natural resource management, uh, sustainable business, uh, energy and urban systems, and food systems. Food studies is a brand new major. We actually were previously offering it as a minor. Um, I believe that was starting in about 2018. Um, food studies is a new major that we're really excited about um, the experiences that students are gonna have, um, especially as they go through the program to their junior year. And then the environmental science program as well as something where um, that population of students is being onboarded into the Falk School. And there's a lot of cross classes, if you will, um, of students of students taking that um, and kind of getting a, a very immersive degree and, and understanding these are the professionals that you're going to be working with. Um, to, to your question a little bit more on the, um, you know, what kind of student is that and what are they maybe noting in their essay, you know, I would say really popular uh, kind of maybe entry is AP environmental science. That's probably one of the most um, popular things I see students note on their application. Uh, following that would certainly be an involvement in some sort of a uh, green team, some eco league, uh, environmental fund. Um, 4-H is another popular, popular one and Future Farmers of America. I think those are things that I see on applications that are, that I would say are probably the ones that introduce students to the topic and they kind of go, they kind of go at their own pace from there in exploring that. Um, but even for students who didn't have anything that I just mentioned, or they're not in those clubs that I just mentioned. I, I think it's really something where personally, and maybe from a philosophical perspective, you really just see the way the world is right now. And you think there's opportunities or solutions, you know, to solve some of the current problems that we have. And that's really, I think, the biggest theme um, of what those students are really focusing on, very solution oriented and, and problem solving. All of these programs are, are also science oriented. Um, for, for someone to succeed in these programs, what should they be doing in high school in terms of the sciences? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a fantastic question. I, I think, you know, in terms of the, the sciences and, and depending on, you know, some of the programs that you're going to look at, you know, when I talk with our faculty and I hear, get feedback about research or, you know, from students, you know, they're doing something really cool as it relates to, you know, our streams or woodlands. Uh, you know, chemistry certainly is, is something where I'm seeing a lot of students focus a little bit on that, um, on chemistry. Biology, again, that's probably another really popular one. 
Um, but statistics, you know, statistics is typically the, the math that we require students to take as a part of that major. So whether that's an honor stats um, or an, an AP statistics, college and high school were very accepting with those types of credits. That's really where I'm telling students, you know, make sure you're taking the, you know, the required course load, the required math, the required science to graduate, of course. Um, but certainly if you are starting to find yourself, you know, maybe you were interested in biology because, you know, research or the health sciences field was, was interesting maybe when you were in ninth or 10th grade, but now you have an opportunity to integrate geology into your degree or, you know, earth science or atmospheric science, uh, meteorology, if those, if your school is offering those or AP environmental science kind of, you know, the more general one, I would encourage a student to take that because it really just opens up a whole new dynamic of what the sciences are and really what the potential is there. Um, and again, that just relates back towards um, how we can solve, you know, some of our more community focused, our business focused, our environmental focused challenges and, and look at to those with solutions. But I think those, if students are taking the required course load in order to graduate, the opportunity to take elective courses throughout the sciences that are really interesting them, or, um, you know, maybe a little bit more advanced math or physics. Uh, those are things that I think really help set students up positively um, not just for these majors in particular, they very much do, but I would also say, I would also put that caveat on if you are looking to pursue the sciences at the collegiate level in general. Have you seen more applicants? I mean, you, not you personally, but the university seen more applicants or on the transcript, you see advanced chemistry, advanced biology, or AP um, in either of those subjects? Very popular, very popular option across across the institution. Um, it, it's really it's really encouraging to see the amount of um, advanced courses that are being offered to students at all. You know, in, whether you're talking about public schools, private schools, um, charter schools, boarding schools, independent schools, um, it's really encouraging to see those opportunities. It's even more encouraging, you know, to see that so many of our applicants are taking on that challenge. And again, that gives us some great conversational pieces to have with them um, and just academically prepare them for, um, you know, what's going to happen next. Chatham is test optional? Chatham University is test optional. We have always been test optional as a school. Um, it's a really wonderful process just to holistically learn about a student. And I think gives students also a little bit more stake to their, stake to their application. Um, we give of course, you know, previously, um, prior to the pandemic, um, we were taking test scores as well as GPA um, for this 2021, uh, the upcoming fall 2021 application cycle. We are not requiring test scores to be a part of a student's application. Um, what's been really unique about that is just seeing how much more students are focused on articulating what they are doing, not just I am this person in this club, but this is what I do in this club. This is what I do in my school district. This is what I do in my community. Um, so that's always a really exciting thing to see because once they're admitted, we just do such a phenomenal job of as a campus welcoming you into the opportunities that are available here. It, it really makes for a streamlined process. Do you ask these students to write more than just a Common App essay? You know what, we don't ask them to write more than a Common App essay, but we've been finding and certainly even in prior to our conversation, it, it, I'm really seeing probably, I would say, at least 75% of the applications have not just the common application writing sample or, or the essay or academic writing sample, um, but they're also including a personal statement as well, too, as to maybe why they're pursuing a particular major, why um, there are some things highlighted on their application that they want to draw a little bit more attention to. Um, but it, it's really welcoming to see. And again, it's just another lens and another dynamic that we get to learn about students coming to our school. Are students on campus now or are they virtual? Uh, students are on campus now. And, and that was something, again, just, you know, a lead, from a leadership perspective with our institution and, and institutional buy-in and, and not just, again, at the leadership level, our, our students. Um, you know, none of this happens being in camp, being in the classroom, um, having a campus community without our students buying into that. So it, it's really welcoming and it's really encouraging that we've been able to see that. But um, no, we, we have hybrid courses. Uh, students, of course, if they wanted to learn um, in an online virtual format, uh, we did a wonderful job of making that opportunity available. Um, 
I see you know hybrid courses, of course. Um, and then we also have in-person courses as well too with the necessary social and physical distancing um, as well. But um, it, we're very fortunate for, for that. And uh, again, it's just you know hats off to our student body and, and administration for making that happen. Have doubles become singles or anything? Yeah, there was some de so there was some de-densification. I don't have all the I don't know all the particulars off the top of my head. Um, probably why I don't know all the particulars off the top of my head is I know that that was a, a <laughs> that was a that was an effort um, that our residence life staff worked so hard um, to make sure that that physical distancing and that social distancing capacity was going to be something where students didn't have to stress over that. Um, and they and they really had a real wonderful system and and we got a lot of again positive feedback in that onboarding process too you came to chatham with prior knowledge of sustainability so i came to chatham with prior knowledge of sustainability uh, a little bit more from a personal perspective um i lived in the south pacific for a while in in new zealand um particularly queenstown in the in the otago region where it referred to as the adventure capital of the world um, and you see a lot of ecotourism that happens specifically with Fjord and National Park um, and the Southern Alps in general. But um, you, you really see the community um, and external tourists um, buy into why this is a special place. And so when, when you're talking about maybe different roads and infrastructure on that campus, you know, we could, you know, we could drill a hole through uh, the mountains and you know, make this drive time in half, but then that you're spending four hours driving through a tunnel, not, you know, beautiful New Zealand. Uh, why do that? And obviously drilling a tunnel on a fault line can have its own complications as well too. Uh, but then even lit, uh, spending a lot of time in Australia and Fiji, seeing what ecotourism had on, on their communities, and especially when you're talking about, you know, different impacts of weather and climate as it relates to the Great Barrier Reef or, you know, the Asawa Island chain, these communities very much rely heavily on their ability to provide an experience for people like myself who were fortunate enough to be there. Um, and it doesn't happen without first and foremost understanding that they need to have a sustainable business practice. They need to have a community that buys into that. And then most importantly, they need to have buy-in from, you know, whatever government officials or community is to protect the environment and wild spaces. So um, I, I was very fortunate to, um, I guess to be aware and acknowledge that while I was there. And so certainly um, as I was learning more about Chatham University and I was um, you know, learning more about the Falk School of Sustainability and Environment, it was uh, quite frankly, this, this, this uh, position, this opportunity, it's a dream come true to work with the students who are gonna be able to influence those, those next parts of policy and science and decisions. Given your knowledge base and your time at Chatham, what would make it uh, difficult for another college to do something like this, just to create a community like this? You know, I think, I, I think the the only diff not maybe the only difficult part, but I, I think the most difficult part would be a unilateral understanding of why we do this. And, and I think um, Chatham University, we've done a wonderful job again, top down into our student population and, and staff and, and administration leadership. Why do we care about sustainability? And so when uh, when another campus or excuse me, another university is, is maybe looking to um, is maybe looking to take on this opportunity to build a new a new campus community focused around, you know, the three pillars of sustainability or the environment. You know, I, I think it's it's kind of a collective do we all know why? Can we answer why we are doing this? Can we answer who are the people that we want to serve and, and what are the outcomes that we want to have in this? Um, I think we've done, just done such a wonderful job from um, the origins of campus to, to this point right now and, and making sure that we're periodically and frequently asking ourselves those questions. Um, and it gives us you know, a streamlined process. Not that you know, if there's not, it's little ups and downs, um, but all the same, I would say if you were just going, if you were an institution very much, hey, we want, we want to mimic what Chatham is doing here, you know, I, I think first and foremost, it would be establishing where are our strengths, why do we want to do this, and, um, you know, who, are the, who is the end goal, what is the benefit of us establishing this? And I think um, as you can answer those questions from a positive manner, as well as, you know, address those challenges, I think it can be a very... Um, 
intuitive and, and maybe, I don't want to say easy. There's nothing about um, building a new campus that's, that's easy. Um, but, you know, all the same, I think when you have a community, a collective community buy-in and you can answer those questions, that will really help you overcome what those challenges are. Chatham has a fairly small undergrad student body, right? We're a little north, we're, excuse me, we're a little north of uh, 1,200 students at the undergraduate level, but, um, you know, even prior to the pandemic, Chatham University has been welcoming uh, record-breaking undergraduate class after, you know, record-breaking undergraduate class. We have consistent growth um, year over year, whether that's in our sustainability and environment, sustainability and folk school of sustainability and environment, excuse me, um, or whether that's, you know, majors throughout the institution towards, you know, political science or business or um, immersive media, whatever, you know, whatever have you, we have consistent, we, we have this consistent growth. And, and I think it goes down to our mission and values. I think it goes down to our location. Um, and so we're excited about um, the growth that we have. We're excited where, um, you know, as a team, um, not just here in the admissions office, but as, a, as an institutional team, um, where we left off um, with the pandemic um, and, and where we're looking to the future to positively grow. How many uh, freshmen would you like to enroll this fall? Oh, wow. Ooh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I don't necessarily know the specific number on that. Uh, I would probably say, you know, we would look to about 400, 400 to 450 students, I would say, would be, you know, a really, would be a really great class. Um, you know, I think there's always a goal in, in, in our institution. Um, we always aim, you know, we, we always aim high. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate to work with some very motivated individuals um, from a leadership perspective and, and a colleague perspective that, that we really pour our heart and soul in making this campus community um, accessible to everyone and, and making a personalized experience and taking a personalized approach. Um, historically, it, it really seems that that's what students looking for a private liberal arts education, that's what they're looking for in general. Um, and so with our approach and our, and our commitment back to the student, um, you know, we, we in turn try to set for us um, lofty goals. So the Falk School and Eden Hall, they've increased interest in Chatham overall? 100%, 100% they have. Um, I'm wor I work with students year over year where, this is a perfect example actually, um, you know, we have a really strong biology program, science department in general across the institution, but, um, you know, we, we have a really popular option with a three plus two integrated degree program for our physician's assistant program. I will put in the caveat, we very much have one for our master of science and sustainability and our master of art and food studies. Um, but as an example, I work with a lot of students who are focused on the health sciences at Chatham but they make the Eden Hall campus a part of their tour. Um, they specifically look to make that a part of their tour following their time on campus. So whether that's, you know, um, a tour, a meeting with myself, meeting with students within their major, and then, you know, we want to see what this campus is about because maybe um, they come from a little bit more of an outdoors focused background. And, and yeah, the health sciences um, at that point in their life is probably, you know, a little bit more towards their passion and career goals, which is fine. Um, but they also really want to make a sustainable community, a sustainable lifestyle, a part of what their student experience as well, too. So, um, you know, we, we host students um, not just from Pennsylvania, but Washington State, Oregon, California, Colorado, um, just to kind of name, just to name a few, um, even actually Alaska, um, that they will come to Chatham maybe not be focused on a major towards the environmental uh, environmental sciences, sustainability, or food studies, um, but they want to see that campus because they want to integrate that as a part of their lifestyle and a part of their curriculum. Brian, thank you for spending time with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. I appreciate it. It's been, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Have a good day. Take care. You too.